Good morning. Good to have you here today. We're looking forward to that time when we can be reunited, rejoined together, be able to see one another face to face, be able to greet one another, and let one another know how much we appreciate each other. This has been a difficult time. This is, I believe, our fourth week now that we have to live stream and can't have the whole congregation here. I want you to know we miss you and we wish that you were here to be able to physically be with us, but we know that you're here with us in spirit and in mind and in song. This morning, we're going to sing together. We're going to have communion together. I will bring a lesson from God's Word starting in Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse 20. We're going to look at that passage of Scripture because today is a day when the Christian world stops and remembers the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we do that every Lord's Day as we gather around this table to remember His death, His burial, and His resurrection. The resurrection being the most important. Without the resurrection, we would have no hope for the future. May God bless you as you join us this morning as we sing praises, read scripture, pray together, and have fellowship one with another. God bless you. Good morning, church, and all, the, all those of you in today on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. This is the time that we take up a collection for the continuation of God's work. Normally we would pass the baskets between the pews to all, to all our congregation here, but because the times have changed, we need to do this a little bit differently. There are several opportunities for, for all of you to continue your giving. You can do that via uh, mail. You can use your bank uh, electronic banking systems, or you can just drop it by Dennis's office during the day. There are just, just several ways that you can continue to give, and this is such an important part of our prayer life. I'd like to go to this through the scripture. Yeah. The most important part about giving is that it comes from our, our heart. Uh, I, I really believe that that's the most important thing. And I'd like to go to uh, book of Mark, Mark 12, chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offering were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the tre temple treasury. Many rich, rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put everything in, all she had to live on. So this is this is really true. This is key to to giving. You know, it's it's uh, all about coming from your heart. What Jesus has done for you, and this is how you show that. This is how you give back. Uh, and. And I just want you to all encourage everyone that uh, they consider this and, uh, and give this a lot of thought as they give back to a little bit of what God has richly blessed them. On this bright and sunny uh, Easter morning, we find ourselves in the strangest of times. It's a very unique situation. Unlike none that we can quite remember in our past lifetimes, um, there is uh, so much uh, upset in the world. It seems like the world has been turned upside down on its axes. Uh, there's record job loss. Um, the social interruptions that's taken place in our lives are reaching far and wide. Um, for instance, we can't gather together in fellowship. Christian fellowship as we are so used to doing. We can't go to the restaurants with our family and friends and get together and visit. Uh, we can't go to sporting events, which so many people attend and are so important to them. The football games, the baseball games, all the rest, the movies and the plays, and all forms of entertainment have been foreclosed. 
it's just uh, such a change. Even the kids can't go to school in react with one another. So it's, it's, it truly is a, a situation that reaches uh, everybody and it uh, causes a lot of anxiety for many. Um, there is a, a fear for the future and it has actually forced millions into a, a condition of idleness, which is not really a good thing. God didn't make people to be idle. But uh, as a result of that, it's created a situation where uh, contemplation and reflection uh, has cropped up and become necessary. And uh, as people think about the situation, many can't find uh, peace. Uh, from uh, many things. Economic fears are, are one of the, the main reasons that people are nervous of. They don't know if they'll lose their job. They don't know if they'll lose their house. They don't know if they'll lose their business. They don't know if they'll use up all their savings for the future. And many even fear for their very lives. It is truly a uh, extremely unsettled state of affairs. Um, everyone is tired of this terrible situation, and they they hope that it will end, but don't know when it will. <clears throat> they hope for a new day and a better time, uh, but uh, they don't know uh, whether that will come. When it will come, it's just a great unknown. Uh, today is cited as the day of the year that uh, uh, Christ resurrected, and it is celebrated across the land by many. It's a special day. We uh, uh, celebrate the, the uh, resurrection, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ every week. We do that because of its great import to us. Um, we, uh, we find that uh, uh, that is one of the most important things that we come together for. We don't have to wait for an unknown day of hope. That, that continual and eternal day of hope was manifested in us Christians the day we believed in him. Uh, we believe that he uh, uh, was the only begotten Son of God, that he died upon the cross for the uh, remission and propitiation of the sins of all mankind. As we believed in him, uh, we uh, also were baptized into his death. Uh, and as we were baptized into his death, we were, were reborn into newness of eternal life. Everyone has and continues to sin and is separated from God uh, as a result of those sins. That is true unless you know Jesus. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, he accomplished at least two major feats. He brought forgiveness for the sins of all mankind, for the past, present, and future, for those that believe in him. Um, the other thing that uh, he accomplished was uh, he brought uh, justification uh, by giving God's righteousness to us uh, by his intercession on our behalf. As a result, God, by His grace, has extended righteousness and sees us as righteous through His eyes and saved us from judgment and bound us over to eternal life with Him. For that, Christ paid a huge price. For Him being able to give us that gift, He paid an extremely high price. <clears throat> he came to us with the good news of the gospel, and he only wanted to do good for us. That was his whole mission. Uh, instead, he was rejected and persecuted. He was mocked and degraded. 
He was uh, flogged and beaten. He was uh, put into a, a situation where uh, because of what he was trying to do, his mental uh, thoughts probably were of severe rejection and, and uh, as they placed that crown of thorns on his head and pushed it into his skull, you know, you can imagine what he was thinking. Reflection of them spitting on him as he went through the streets. Uh, they gave him a cross uh, to drag through the streets on the way to Golgotha. When he got to Golgotha, uh, they laid him on that cross and, and uh, nailed him to it with large spikes in his hands and his feet. When they had done that, they lifted him up and dropped him into a hole hanging on that cross, and you can imagine the jolt to the Adam on that cross reached to the bottom of that hole. And as he stood there hanging on that cross, as he uh, hung there on that cross, suspended between heaven and earth, instead of calling for 10,000 angels to come and uh, save him and uh, turn his enemies from him, and instead of doing that, uh, he prayed to God on their behalf to forgive them for they did not know what they had done. And after doing that, he gave up his spirit unto God the Father. Three days later, he arose from the dead and brought forth a new beginning for mankind, like a new blossom on a warm and sunny spring day. Uh, and the foundation of our hope was cast in concrete. For those that are suffering and worrying and filled with anxiety, I urge you to find Jesus. Even though God allows rain to fall on the heads of the just as well as the unjust, uh, he will give you strength and comfort and the peace to deal with any trial if you have a relationship with Jesus. It is for the amazing and wonderful gift that uh, Jesus brought to us that we uh, remember him today. Uh, Christ asked us to remember him, him in a certain way. He asked us to partake of uh, his, some, his supper and to come together in communion with him. Uh, that is what we're uh, about to do here. Uh, we're going to partake of the bread and fruit of the vine, which represents his body and his shed blood. Uh, I'll ask you uh, all at home to bow with me as I uh, go to God in prayer for the uh, for the uh, bread. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have the opportunity to gather together in your name. We, uh, we are so thankful that we, as Christians, know Jesus and that we are so uh, aware of the great gift and the value of what he has done for us. And, and as a result of that, and as his um, command that we remember him in the way that uh, we are doing here now. We, as we partake of this bread, we pray that each and every one of us will examine ourselves as we have been instructed to do, so that we do not partake of it in an unworthy manner. We pray that you will bless each and every one that partakes of this and continue to forgive us our sin. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I will again offer up a short prayer uh, relating to the cup. Almighty God, we continue our prayer unto you, thanking you for the fact that Christ came and hung on the cross and shed his blood um, for us. It's an unbelievable thing that he did. It's a mystery that, that uh, is hard to understand of how he would do what he did for those that so often persecuted him. Uh, and we today is to continue to perse persecute him in the way that we live sometimes. Uh, we, are, we regret the things that we do, the things that we fall short of. We're so, uh, um, so um, inclined to uh, do good that we fall short, as Paul mentions in Romans. Uh, the things that he wants to do, he doesn't do, and the things that he doesn't want to do, he does. The thorns in the flesh 
extend to the humanity and uh, we, uh, we are just so thankful that because of our faith in Christ Jesus, even in spite of our actions and our works, that uh, by that faith uh, and belief in him, that we can be forgiven our sins. So again, we ask that you bless all of those that partake of this uh, fruit of the vine, the blood of Christ. In his name we pray. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Mark. Mark the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 6. If you'd like to follow along with me. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll the stone away for us for the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled away. And although it was extremely large, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe. And they were amazed. And they said to him, And he said to them, Do not be amazed looking for Jesus, a Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold, his place, this is the place where they have laid him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most important event in world history. We look at events in our lifetime, like the taking out of the Twin Towers in New York City, and how tragic that was. Or for older folks, World War II, when they bombed Pearl Harbor. And we think that those are terrible times, and they are in our history. But this is the greatest event in world history. That Jesus came and lived and died and rose again so that we could have the opportunity to be reunited with God. Because sin had separated us from God. When Adam and Eve sinned and were kicked out of the garden, sin became part of this world. And we, one day in our life, chose to go against God. When we reached a certain age, we decided that we were going to do things our way. So we sinned and separated ourselves from God. It is through that separation then that the resurrection comes into place where Jesus died so that my sins could be washed away and I can be reunited with my Heavenly Father, with the Creator of the world. That's really what the resurrection is all about. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that He was who He says He was, that His purpose on this earth was to bring peace to all men, to be able to forgive their sins and wash them away, and God says that he'll remember those sins no more. Two or three ladies who had stood by the cross at the crucifixion, Mary, Mary the mother of, James, mother of James and Salome, came early in the morning just as the sun began to rise to be able to anoint the grave of Jesus, to be able to put spices in the, the cross that he was wrapped in. And on the way, in their exuberance and in their grief, they said, there's a stone there. Who's, who's going to roll away the stone? We, we don't have the strength to do that. But upon coming to the tomb, they realized that the stone was already rolled away and that they could enter the tomb. And when they did, of course, there was an angel sitting there and said, basically, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Jesus has risen from the grave. There was an obstacle in their way. But the obstacle didn't stop them from doing what they wanted to do and what they needed to do. Sometimes we let the obstacles of life keep us from being the kind of people that we ought to be, of saying the things that we need to say, of being able to witness to somebody our love for Christ, and to show them in the scriptures that they too need to be obedient to Christ. 
Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And yet, in our exuberance, sometimes in our grief, sometimes in our, just because we're frightened, we're afraid to say to somebody, I'm a Christian. And I'd like to share with you why I'm a Christian, and why I walk in this way. There was an obstacle, a huge obstacle, a stone in their way, and yet they went forward even in their grief, even in their exuberance for Christ. They were willing to do what no one else was willing to do. They went to the grave that Joseph had laid Jesus in, in the tomb in the mountain. Looking upon that, they saw the stone rolled away, and although it was extremely large, they still went their way. There's a place in Jerusalem that they say is the tomb of Jesus, but we really don't know what that tomb was. We have a picture of what it might have looked like. It was in a mountain, on the side of a hill, a very rocky area, and out of that mountainside was hewn a grave was belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, who was evidently very wealthy because poor people didn't get this kind of grave. And Joseph of Arimathea was willing to give his grave, his tomb, to Jesus. He boldly went before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And when it was granted, he took that bloody body of Jesus down from the cross he wrapped it in the claws that he had brought so that Jesus could be prepared for a burial. And he laid Jesus in that tomb that belonged to him. And then he and probably others rolled that stone against the entrance of that tomb. And just to make sure that no one stole the body of Jesus, soldiers were placed there. And a seal was placed on that tomb so that if anybody disturbed that stone, everybody would know. So here comes three ladies who love Jesus, who just wanted to anoint his body. And as they get there, the stone was rolled away, and there was an angel sitting inside that tomb. Matthew tells us that an earthquake rolled away the stone in Matthew 28 and verse 2. Matthew says that there had been an earthquake and that an angel had rolled the stone away. It wasn't men at all. Matthew also tells us in the Matthew the 28th chapter, verses 3 and 4, that the angel was also so frightening that the guards fell down like dead men. So when these three ladies came to the tomb, there was the soldiers passed out, looked like dead men laying there because they were so frightened of the angels and the angel that had taken the stone away. So that's the scene of the women as they approach the tomb. In Mark 16 and verse 5, it says, Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. Notice the different reaction to the angels. The soldiers were frightened and fell over dead. Mary, and Mary the mother of James, and Salome, they looked in, and while they were taken back, they listened to what the man, the, the angel, had told them. Oftentimes, angels appear in the Bible as men. And this is a picture of someone that may have been what it may have looked like to them. An angel. Don't worry. He's not here. He is risen. He's no longer in the grave. He did just exactly what he said he was going to do, and yet nobody believed him. I don't think anybody expected when they came to that tomb to find that Jesus had risen. His own disciples were kind of hiding away, frightened that they would be arrested for being with him. And so when Mary, Mary the mother of James and Salome, saw that it was Jesus who had resurrected from the dead. You realize that the first person that Jesus appeared to was Mary Magdalene, the one who he had casted seven demons out of? She got the privilege of seeing Jesus first of all. What an honor that must have been. 
And yet it didn't dissuade her from doing what she needed to do. She went back into the city to tell the, the, the apostles and the disciples there that Jesus had risen from the dead. Mark and Matthew mentioned that there's only one angel, but Luke says there were two angels. So that must be a discrepancy. And so people throw out the Bible because there must have been a mistake there. And yet, when we realize that each person told things of the resurrection as they saw it, as they understood it, it's not a, dis it's not a disparity at all. It's not a dis description at all. It tells us that they didn't copy each other. They didn't call some council together to decide exactly what they were going to write about the resurrection. They simply told their own minds and their own words what they saw and what they were to write down as they were guided by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 16, verses 6 through 8, it says, And he said to them, Do not be amazed, for you are looking for Jesus of Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there he, you will see him, just as he told you. It's interesting to me that she, they were to tell the disciples, but also Peter. Why Peter? Because you remember that before Jesus was crucified, while he was being beaten and on trial, that he was in the courtyard and he denied Jesus three times. And he had great remorse for that. The Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. He repented of that. And I think Jesus wanted to encourage Peter. Peter, I forgive you. It's okay. I just want you to know that what I told you is true. And if you'll just go to Galilee where I told you, there I will appear to you. So Peter must have been encouraged by those words. In fact, it was Peter and John who ran to the grave. And John, of course, likes to let, let us know that he was a little bit younger. And he beat Peter to the grave. And when he got there, he stopped. But Peter rushed headlong in looking for Jesus. We know that Peter must have realized at that time that God had forgiven him and that all was okay. So in Matthew 16 and verse 8, it says, They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling, uh, these are the ladies there, and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid, but they went on to tell the disciples. Luke tells us that it was Peter and John who ran there first. What about the rest of the apostles? What about the rest of the followers of Jesus? When they'd heard that, they denied it and said, well, that couldn't happen. That certainly wasn't the way that it happened. Jesus certainly had raised from the dead. They had forgotten the words that he had told them over and over again. My kingdom is not of this world, he said. I will meet you in Galilee just a few days later. And of course, later on, we find that he appeared to them. Look at Mark 16 and verse 9. After he had, now, after he had risen early from the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. And she went and reported to those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they refused to believe him. They were talked to somebody about Christ. They were talked to somebody about your walk with Christ. And that now you belong to him and you'd like to share with them that gospel message. And they don't believe it. They don't want to listen to it. Because it will mean a change in their life. It means that they can't live in the worldly way that they're living. And so they must repent like we did. Confess his name before men. Be buried with him in baptism. Where our sins are washed away. And once that happens, the Lord adds us to his church. Acts 2 and verse 47. God puts in the church who he wants there who are obedient to him. Mark 16 verses 12 through 13 says, And after that he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country. They went away and reported it to others, but they didn't believe them either. Sometimes people just don't believe what you have to tell them. 
And so that's an opportunity to be able to sit down with them, let them study God's word for their end. In the New Testament, we find the way back to God. That's really our mission. That's our purpose. And a little later on in this passage, we see what we hear, what we call today the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, he told the apostles. And he told them exactly what to say, what to do. But after Jesus had raised from the dead, and after Peter and John had ran into the tomb, Jesus is now walking on the road to Emmaus. You might remember that story in the scriptures. Two men were walking along, and Jesus comes along, and he's walking behind them or with them, and they're talking about the events that took place in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? And they said, didn't you know? We thought everybody knew that Jesus Christ was crucified. And so Jesus listened intently. He let them share their story. And then he went to their home and they invited him in for breakfast. And he sat down at the table and broke bread. The Bible said their eyes were opened and they realized that this was the same Jesus who they had seen crucified, risen from the dead. So Jesus appeared to these two men on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the apostles on several occasions. Uh, in, in Mark 16, verses 14 and 15, it says, And afterward he appeared to the eleven themselves, and they were reclining at the table, and he approached them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who had seen him after he had risen. They just needed to be reminded as to who he was. The idea of sharing the story of Jesus is very important for the Christian faith. We need to pass that information along, not only to our children and to our children's children, we need to pass it along to our friends, to our neighbors, to our co-workers. We have a mission, much like the apostles had a mission. Their mission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We have that same mission today. Look at Mark 16, verses 15 through 18. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has baptized, been baptized shall be saved. But he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. If they, and if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now we know that that happened and the apostles did those very things for the commission was given to them. But in the New Testament, we find that we too have a commission. We have a responsibility to share the good news of the gospel with everyone else. The kingdom of darkness will not stand against the gospel. Satan is a mighty, powerful creature here on this earth. He'll deceive anybody that he can to get them to go his way. Christ Jesus came so that we could be with the Father throughout eternity. So Satan could try to destroy the kingdom, but it will not be destroyed. Jesus Christ established his kingdom, and when we're obedient, we get to be a part of that kingdom. Look at Mark 16, verses 19 through 20. So then when the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed by, by the signs that followed. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave was truly something that the world needs to know and understand. The world, the Christian world, celebrates it at what we call Easter, which is not really a biblical word. It's found in the King James Version back in, in uh, the 1611 version of, of the King James Version of the Bible. But really the scriptures talk about the resurrection and how important that is. So we celebrate the resurrection every Lord's Day as we gather around this table as we remember Him and the difference that He made. Jesus goes on before and He comes on long afterward to give us hope that this life is just a life where we prepare our lives to be able to spend eternity with Him. 
And if you've been obedient to Christ and you're ready to be a part of the body of Christ, Jesus invites you to be buried with him in baptism. Our baptistry is ready at all times for those who are interested and those who are willing. I've had people call me and say, I've thought about it. I've been reading scripture. I know I need to be baptized into the Lord. Would you do that today? We have the baptism baptismal ready for you. I have one young man who said, I don't want to be in a baptistry. I want to go to the river. I want to be baptized like Jesus. It was a rather cold spring afternoon, and the water was very cold. But that was his will. We baptized him into Christ. And from that point on, his life changed. And it will change for you as well. If you're not a Christian, now's the time to reassess where you are, to re-look at the New Testament, to find out that the resurrection is truly for you. It will last for eternity when you're obedient. May God bless you as we spend this time together each Lord's Day, looking at God's Word, reflecting on what it will mean to us and what it means to us so that we can be changed people, people who walk with Christ for the rest of our lives. May God bless you as you consider the words of the Scripture today. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you've been blessed by our time together. Soon and very soon, we'll be able to meet together as a congregation again. We look forward to that time. In the meantime, Let's be praying for one another. If you have a special need, something that's going on in your life where you need just some sp the special prayers, please call uh, me or one of the elders. We'll put you on the prayer list because we know that prayer changes things. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for all that you bless us with. Help us to count our many blessings and not focus on the things that are difficult, but to focus on how much you've blessed us and the difference you've made in our lives. Help us to take the things that we have learned today and apply them to our lives so that we can truly be an example for you. Father, please bless us all as we strive to serve you. It's in Jesus' great name we pray.